Hello, Lennis. It's good to come your way this time. I'm Bando Charles Kwame, your general chemistry course tutor. And I'm going to handle this course with Mr. Stephen Kwame Amwako. You know that the course code is GBS132. And here I have already given you the course outline. So we are going straight into our unit one. And in unit one, we are going to talk about the structure of the atom and then the arrangements of electrons. Right. Now, before we continue into with the units, I will want you to use this as a diagnostic tool to check yourself. If you're able to complete this and have all your answers correct, then you proceed to go, you proceed to the unit. If not, just put it down, go and revise your periodic table, at least the first 20 elements, and then you come back to complete the unit. Thank you. Right. So let's look at our performance indicators or specific objectives for this lesson. We are saying that by the end of the lesson, you, the learner, should be able, uh, after successful completion of this, you should be able to describe the structure of the atom in terms of the location of protons, neutrons, and electrons in an atom. Again, define the term that are associated with the numbers of protons, electrons, and neutrons. And then describe what we call the Bohr's model of the atom. To also explain the term isotope with examples and allocate electrons into the various allowed energy levels or what you call the shells of the Bohr's model of the atom and then write out electron configuration in terms of the number of electrons in each shell. Good. Here we are looking at what the element is. Now before I continue, I want you to revise on the various particular the particular nature of matter where we have matter being made up of the atom the ion or the molecule and then also you revise the various state of matter and their properties so we have the solid the liquid and the gas together with the plasma state so you revise these things and then we move on so here we are starting straight out with the element so when we say an element, what do we mean by an element? We are saying that an element is just a substance which by now we have no known chemical means to I mean, split it or decompose it into simpler or smaller substances, right? Then we also are saying that elements are the fundamental materials of which all matter is made up of. So when we pick a matter, the basic materials or the fundamentals are just elements. Now we also say that elements is made up of very tiny particles that we call atoms. So atoms make up what we call the element. So without an atom, there can't be an element. And then we also say that an element can also be said, uh, uh, an element can also be said to be a substance which have the same kind of atoms, just the same as what we have said already. Good. So per our curriculum or per what we are to study, we are supposed to know the element on the periodic table from the very first one through to the number 20 on the periodic table. Basically from hydrogen to calcium. So if you are even asleep and somebody tap your shoulders to wake you up and you are being asked what is the atomic number of potassium, quickly you have to say it is 19. Or if they ask what is the chemical symbol for phosphorus, then you should know that it is P. Or atomic number of silicon, you should know that it is 14. So try to memorize them. In those days you were having some acronym that you were using to do the memorization. So don't forget, try to at least the first 20 elements, very important. So this is a periodic table that you can just read for yourself. Now on the periodic table we have what we call the alkali metals. And these are metals or elements that can react with water to form strong bases 
And these strong bases, they have the ability or the capability to react with acid to form what you call the salt and water in a process called neutralization. We'll look at neutralization reaction in future times. So these metals, we have the lithium, the sodium, potassium, for the first 20 elements, and beyond that we have rubidium, cesium, and francium. These are all group one. So on the periodic table, you see all these elements under the very first group. And so these are what we call the alkali metals. Now we also have the non-metallic elements. And these ones, they don't have the properties of these metals, but they mostly form the negative ions when they are reacting to form ionic compounds. So to add to this, before you want to see that a particular element is a metal or not, Basically, if it's a metal, it should have either one, two, or three electrons in its outer shell. We look at that. With the exception of hydrogen, all other elements with one, two, or three electrons in the outer shell are all metals. Then those with five, six, seven electrons in the outer shell, they are non-metallic elements. And those who have either two or, uh, sorry, who have a fully filled shell is they are called the noble gases. Like if I pick those group eight elements like argon, like neon, krypton and the rest, they have the outer shell fulfilled. If I pick helium, helium has two electrons in its outer shell, which is fully filled. And so those ones are unreactive and they are called noble gases and they don't react with any other atom to form any compound. So take note of that. Now examples of this non-metallic element, we have the chlorine, fluorine, sulfur, and the resin. Look at chlorine, it has seven electrons in outer shell. Fluorine has also seven. These are group seven elements, right? We have oxygen, which has six electrons in outer shell nitrogen and all of that. These are all non-metallic elements. Now we are going to look at various models that were used to propose the structure of the atom that we are using currently. Now we are not going to go into much. Various models were proposed but we are looking at the, the Dalton's atomic model. So here we are not going to go into details you can read the details for yourself, but we're only going to look at the summary of the Dalton's theory. So in the year 1808, John Dalton postulated his famous atomic theory that the summary is one of them, that everything is composed of atoms which are the indivisible blocking, so building blocks of matter and cannot be destroyed. What he's saying here is that if matter is to be seen as a building, then the very block that we used to build it is atoms, or so are atoms, and these atoms can never be divided into any other substances. Again, it's also saying that all atoms of an element are identical. So here, if I take sodium element, all the atoms should look alike. That is what he meant by that. And then the another one is that he said that the atoms of different elements vary in size, mass, and other properties. So, of course, if I pick sodium atom and hydrogen atom, the size should be different, the mass is also different, and then the properties are also different. So when you see on the periodic table, you see atoms with different atomic masses, and then all their sizes are also different. Again, compounds are produced through different whole number combinations of atom. He said that for compound to produce just different numbers of atoms will come together to form the compounds. And then he also said a chemical reaction results in the element of atoms in the reactant and what products or the re rearrangement of atoms in the reactants and then the products compounds. So he's saying that for chemical reaction to occur, just a matter of rearranging the atoms in the reactant. In any chemical reaction, we have reactant and then the product. So when there's rearrangement of the atoms, we have 
chemical reactions. Right. So this is what's or this is a summary of the Bohr's model of the atom. Now we still move on with the atomic models. So let's look at this, watch this video carefully and after that we will continue. Bohr's model of atom. Various models of the atom have been proposed by eminent scientists over the years. These models have increased our understanding of the atomic structure. Among these models, Rutherford suggested that electrons revolve around the nucleus in well-defined orbits, but there was a problem with this. The motion of electrons in Rutherford's model was unstable because any charged particle moving in a circular path emits electromagnetic radiation, thus the electrons would lose energy and fall into the nucleus, making the atom highly unstable. Then, which would be a better model of an atom? To overcome the objections against Rutherford's model of atom, Niels Bohr in 1913 proposed a new atom model. What does this model propose? It first proposes that electrons revolve around the nucleus in specific orbits and these orbits are associated with definite energies and are called shells or energy levels. These orbits or shells are represented by the letters K, L, M, N. The maximum number of electrons that can be accommodated in a particular orbit is 2n to the power of 2 where n is the number of the orbit, thus k shell would have 2 electrons, l shell would have 8 electrons, m shell would have 18 electrons, and n shell would have 32 electrons and so on. That said, what does this model next propose? It next proposes that the maximum number of electrons that can be accommodated in the outermost level is 8. And finally, it says that the orbit closest to the nucleus has minimum energy and the orbit farthest has the maximum energy. Well then, does an electron radiate energy by itself? Since electrons move in a particular orbit, they do not radiate energy by themselves. What happens instead is when an atom absorbs energy, the electrons get excited and jump into the next higher energy level. The electron can radiate energy and return to its original state or drop down to the next energy level. Bohr's model works well for simple atoms and is easy to understand. It is one among the atomic structures still in use today and the other being the quantum mechanical model. Things to remember In 1913, a Danish physicist Niels Bohr proposed an atomic model known as Bohr's atomic model. In an atom, the electrons revolve around the nucleus in definite energy levels called orbits or shells. The maximum number of electrons that can be accommodated in a particular orbit is 2n to the power of 2. The maximum number of electrons that can be accommodated in the outermost shell is 8. The orbit closest to the nucleus has minimum energy and the orbit farthest has maximum energy. Electrons are excited to the higher energy levels by absorbing energy and return to the lower energy levels by radiating energy. Alright, so... Rutherford also came with his atomic model, but as for him, his model was that as the electrons are moving around the nucleus, they radiate or emit radiations. And so in other words, you emit radiations, you lose energy. And so you realize that with time, the atom will collapse or the electron will just spiral into the nucleus. So Ball came to, I mean, shape the model proposed by Rutherford. So Bohr said that the atom, the electrons are moving in a definite orbit and these orbits are called shells around the nucleus. So they don't lose energy or they don't radiate. Before radiation will occur, the electrons should either absorb uh, energy 
or give out energy. Uh, so when the electrons are able to absorb energy, as you saw from the video, it will now move from one cell to another cell. And so as it moves, then it can give out radiations. So if that atom is excited into another level, and then at that level, if it wants to come back, it should also release that energy it absorbed. And then it also give out radiation. That is what ball cells. So let's look at the summary of Ball's model. So he is saying that, as we say in 1930, as we saw from the video, he proposed what we call the quantized shell model of the atom to explain how electrons can have stable orbits around the nucleus and not lose electrons, or so not lose energy as the electrons orbit as proposed by Rutherford. So Ball said that electrons move in orbits of fixed size and energy. So the orbit or the shells of the electrons, they are fixed size and the fixed energy. And again, he also said the energy of the electron depends on the size of the orbits. And it's lower for smaller orbits. So for instance, the case cell, as we saw from the video, has a low, the lowest energy or the, the lowest energy because the size of that one is also the smallest. Because it's the closer to the nucleus, it has the smallest energy. And so, because the size is also small. Then, he said the electron can only gain or lose energy when they jump from one allowed orbit to another thereby absorbing or emitting electromagnetic radiations. So you can either, when you are absorbing, you will definitely going to jump into one energy level to another. So you can't just lose or gain energy unless you are making a transition from an allowed orbit to another one. Now it's also said that the atom will be completely what? stable with the smallest orbit since there is no orbit of lower and lower energy into which the electrons can jump right so we are now going to look at the structure of the atom as proposed by Bohr so per what we are going to do is the Bohr's model that we are going to use often so the Bohr's model, we have our nucleus, which is the black object that you see. And inside the nucleus, we have what you call the protons and then the neutrons. The protons are in yellow and then the neutrons are in blue. Please, we are just using this. These are just graphical models to show you what the atom. Of course, the atom can never be seen with our naked eye. And so it doesn't mean that the color of the proton is yellow and the color of the neutron is green. I am only using this for your understanding. Then outside the nucleus, we have the first cell, which is called the K shell. And in the K shell, it can take only maximum of two electrons. And these two electrons are in constant orbits around the nucleus. So as you can see, the electrons are moving and they will never stop their movement. So we have another shell, which is the L shell which also has two electrons and those electrons, so it can be any number depending on the atom you are doing, but it takes only a maximum of eight. So per this model, they will just continue their motion till the kingdom will come. So we are saying that an atom is nothing but the smallest particle of an element that can take part in chemical reactions. Please, this definition is the same thing that you know from senior high school. Somebody says, since the atom has not changed, its definition will also not change. Again, we are saying atoms are made up of a nucleus of positively charged proton, which are just a neutrons, which are neutral, and then the electrons, which are negatively charged, are the one you see in red, constantly moving around. The nuclear. And the orbits of the electrons are called the shells, as we saw in the Bohr's model. Now we, are, we should note that the electrons move in circular orbits around the nuclear, as you can see. And then the atom is set to electrical neutral because for any atom, 
the number of protons and electrons are equal. So if I take the hydrogen atom, I have one proton and one electron. If I take the sodium atom, I have 11 electrons, 11 protons. So it is neutral. And so the neutrality of the atom is dependent upon the, uh, the equality of the neutrons and then the protons. As soon as we change the number of neutrons against, so number of protons against electrons changes. It is no more a neutral atom, but it becomes an ion. Right, we'll look at formation of ion in a future time. Now, this is just what we saw. So here we have the nucleus around it. We also have the first cell, which is K-cell, and then the other cell. All other cells continue. Please, I remember during BEC, I was invigilating and a student drew an atom without a nucleus. And most of you are fond of doing the same. You only draw a circle and then you start the electrons. Once you do that, it means that your atom does not have a nucleus. And any atom without a nucleus is not an atom. So please, when you are drawing, the first, you can either use a dot to represent a nucleus, or if you want to use circles, then the very first circle, do not put any electron around it. That should be your nucleus. You can decide to show protons and neutrons, depend on the question at hand. So the second circle is supposed to be your K shell with two electrons. And then the next circle will have its corresponding number of electrons, depending on the shell you are dealing with, or depend on the atom. If it is an atom like lithium or boron, or even helium. Helium has only two electrons here in the first shell, and so it will not go into the test shell. But lithium have an additional electron sitting here, so it depends on the atom you are doing. Please, again, I stress on the fact that if you draw an atom without the nucleus, it is wrong. Make sure the first, if you are using a circle to represent the nucleus, the first circle is your nucleus, so don't attach any electron to that circle. Thank you very much. Good, so here we have atomic structures of the various, or some of the elements within the first 20. So look at oxygen. It has eight electrons. So this is my nucleus. And then I have protons against neutrons. Now the first cell is taking two. And how many left for the last cell one two three four five six so in all i should have eight let me look at the uh, chlorine atom my nucleus the first cell one two the second one two three four five six seven eight the third one one two three four five six seven so when add it will be amounted to 17. so this is how the drawing of the structures of the atom should be. Please make sure when you are drawing, you do the same. For the showing of electrons, you can just use anything to represent the provided you tell us that this is your electron. Right. Now we look at the subatomic particles. Subatomic particles. Here we are saying that. The proton, the electron, the neutron are the particle that makes up the atom. So there are charges, proton plus one, electron minus one, and the neutral, a uh, neutral which is zero. It means that it is neutral. Now there are side, there are masses, proton has just one, electron one over 1840. That means that if you take, you need 1840 electrons to add up and give you a mass of one proton. And then the neutron is also one. So it tells me that the mass of the atom is concentrated inside the nucleus. Right. And so the positions are also there, you can see. All right. Good, now this is self expression The difference between the protons and the electrons, please, I wouldn't waste time here, just read it. We have the protons which are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. You saw this on the 
subatom particle table, which is the table that we are just using to do this for you. So you see that mass of proton is one, but that of the electron is basically negligible as you compare one and then divide one into 1840 times. So it's negligible. So just read on this. Good. Now we go into what you call the electron configuration. Electron configuration. This electron configuration is nothing but how we arrange electrons in the various shells. Of course, the question is that if I have an atom with eight electrons, do I put all the eight in the first cell, or I jump the first cell, put all the eight in the second cell, or what do I do? And so this electron configuration is going to tell us what we are to do. So we are saying that it refers to arrangements of electrons in the various shells around the nucleus of an atom. So the electron moves around the nucleus in circular way. We have seen that already. And so the shells are also represented by K, L, M, N, N, O, and X, etc. Please don't ask me why we are starting from K and not A. Don't ask me because this is what the scientists gave to us. So we have in ascending order. So the first cell is K cell, which is the closest cell to the nucleus, followed by L, M in that order. Now I have said it's okay, so the closer to the nucleus. Good. Now these are rules that governs the electron configuration. We have the first rule, which is called the duplex rule, which says that the first cell should take maximum of two electrons. Maximum of two electrons. So K cell takes only two electrons. Now we have the second rule, which is called the octet rule. It said that the second cell must contain a maximum of eight electrons, right? Now, besides the two rules we've just discussed, we can also know the number of electrons that must be in each cell. Of course, when we watched the video, we saw that formula. It said that two n squared, where n is the cell number. So if I am to have the first cell, which is cell number one, then to be two times one squared, which is two. So in case cell takes two electrons. Or if I go to the second cell, then n is two, so n squared will be four. Then four times two, eight. So the second cell will take eight. And so it goes on and on and on. Right. Go. So let's look at the electron configuration on the table. So we have hydrogen with symbol eight, atomic number one, then the case shall have only one electron. If you go to carbon, it has six electrons. So first cell to second cell is taking four. Then I have my magnesium, which is having 12 electrons. And then two for the first cell, which is K cell, eight for the L cell and then two for the M shell. So it goes on and on to calcium. This is the within the first 20. So you see calcium is having two, eight, eight, two. Please, the M shell can take maximum, uh, so more than eight electrons, because M shell is the third shell. So three squared will be nine, and nine times will be 18. So it takes maximum of 18 electrons. But you see, we have given it eight and we are bringing two in the end shell. This explanation will be done with a bit of chemistry, a further chemistry outside what we are doing. And I don't want to worry. We have to go into orbitals where we have the S, P, D, F, and the rest. But I don't want to disturb you with that. So for here, just pick it as 2H2. Right, so we are going to look at how we can write the electron configuration. So if I take my sodium, which has 11 electrons, it is 2, 8, 1. So 2 plus 8, 10 plus 1, 11. If I take my calcium, 2, 8, 8, 2, and it will make up 20 electrons. If I take my calcium ion, please, the calcium ion is Ca2 plus. The 2 plus means that the last two electrons are off. It has lost the two electrons. So in this case, the electron configuration will no more be 288, but it will rather, sorry, it will no more be 2882, but it will be 288. 
please take, take note as soon as you see an iron either a positive iron or a negative iron then you have to be careful about what you do look at magnesium iron which is two eight magnesium mg2 plus it has 12 electrons so when the two electrons are off it's going to give you two eight look at the aluminum al2 uh, three plus Aluminum has 13 electrons, and so it should have been 2, 8, 3. But because it's an ion, it's now 2, 8. Right. And then look at my oxygen. Oxygen should have been 2, 6, because it has 8 electrons. And so it should have been 2, 6. But because it has gained additional 2 electrons, it is now 2, 8. So look at aluminum and aluminum ion. Oxygen ion and magnesium ion, they all have the same electron configuration and the uh, electron configuration is the same as that of neon. So don't forget that the formation of ion is to attain stability of noble gas. We'll look at that later. Now fluorine is also seven on the periodic table and it should have seven, so it should be two and then uh, so it's, it's nine. Fluorine is nine on the periodic table, so it should be two seven. But because it has gained additional electron, it is now two eight. So F minus. So please take note of the formation of ion and how the electron configuration should be written. Now I want to look at electron configuration by drawing. Sometimes we can ask you to draw the electron configuration or we ask you to write it. So if you ask you to write, then write. If you ask you to draw, then draw it. If you ask you to do both, so you do it. So let's know how we can draw the electron configuration of neon. Now before the neon, we know it has it is number 10 on the periodic table. So I have my nucleus, which is the black, you see. And the protons and neutrons are being represented there. We don't need to waste our time in showing the number of protons there. We only indicate. Sometimes you may not even do it, but if you ask to show it, then you have to do that. Now I have my first shell, which is in green. This is my first shell. That is the K shell of neon. And how many electrons can this pick? As we said, if you said two, it is right. So I have my two electrons on the first shell, which is there. Okay, so then neon has 10, so we have 8 more electrons. So let's go to the next cell, which is the L cell. And this cell can take maximum of what? 8. But here again, it depends on the number of electrons a particular atom will have. So I have my two of them, another two, another two. And then another. So when you count, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 electrons in this. Please, you see that I drew my nucleus first. Before I started with the next circle, having my electrons. Make sure you do yours the same. If I mark anything of yours and this circle is not there as the nucleus, but you go ahead to draw this circle, with electrons, I will not even waste my time to read anything. I just cancel the market wrong. Good. So these are so we use the same concept to draw for chlorine. You can count and you will get what 17 electrons. We also have this is chlorine ion. So chlorine ion is Cl minus one. So you see a minus on top here. So if you count. Instead of 17 here, you should get 18. So let's do the counting. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and then 18. So chlorine ion is having what? 18 electrons instead of 17 because it has gained additional electron. Right. There is also the sodium. Ion, so a sodium atom which has 11. That is, sodium ion will have the last shell going off. Now, sodium ion now have so it has 10 
electrons instead of 11. So please, this is how we draw the electron configuration. If I ask you to draw, make sure you do justice to this. I use the neon to show you how the drawing should be done. Right. Now we moving away from electron configuration, we go ahead to look at what we call the atomic number. We have been mentioning atomic number, atomic number, atomic number, all the way from the beginning until now. We want to look at what the atomic number is. Now we use the letter Z to represent the atomic number. So here we are saying that the atomic number of an atom is nothing but the name given to the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. So for any atom, its atomic number is equal to the number of protons in that particular atom. Somebody can also define as the number of electrons in a neutral atom. Please, here yeah, I am saying neutral because if the atom is not a neutral atom, the number of protons, so number of electrons would be different from the atomic number. So the proton number of an atom is the same as its what, atomic number. And then the atomic number for, let's say, calcium, for example, is 20. This means that the calcium has what, 20 protons. And so the atomic number of an element can be written as what, a subscript preceding the chemical symbol for the element. So look at this, I have there, if I have an element X, and you see anything down here, it means that this Z is its atomic number. So if, uh, for example, if this is calcium Ca, then my Z is what? 20, right? So examples, I have my hydrogen, H, and then one here, helium, oxygen, chlorine, and the rest. So this is how we write atomic numbers. Please take note of that. Now there is also what you call the mass number. The mass number. And we also use the letter A to represent the mass number. Please if you hear the word mass and when we cast our mind back to the structure of the atom, you realize that uh, the mass of the atom, as I said, majority is within the nuclear because you need 1,840 electrons to give you a mass of one, electron, uh, one proton. And so since uh, neutrons and protons are in the nucleus, then you can have an idea what the mass number would be like. So here we are seeing that the mass number of an atom, or we also call the nuclear number, the total number of protons and what? Neutrons in the nucleus. Total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. We don't consider the electron mass, because the electron mass is virtually negligible. So we have, we have said that A is equal to Z plus N. Don't forget that we have said that the Z with the atomic number is the same as the proton number. So we can also write it as P plus N. So mass number is equal to proton number plus neutron number. Good. So protons and nucleus, so neutrons are referred to as nucleus. Don't forget about this. So if you see AL, A up and Z down. So A is the atomic uh, mass number and C is the atomic number. Then AL is the atom itself. As I have done that. Good. Now we can use mass number and atomic number to identify a particular element. Let's assume that you don't know the element but you know its mass number and its what? Atomic number. You can easily identify that particular element. So, as I said, for example, if I have a particular element with six protons and six electrons together with six neutrons, then the atomic number is six. And then the mass number will be 12 because don't forget the mass number is proton plus neutrons. Then I have six protons and six uh, neutrons. So it is going to give me 12. So you ask yourself, what atom has atomic number 6? Once you go to your periodic table, realize that it is only carbon that has atomic number 6. So therefore, then I'm going to have what? Carbon 12. 
So I said that the element with atomic number six is carbon C. And because eight mass number is 12, we call this what? Carbon 12. So this is how we can use uh, the atomic number and then the mass number to identify a particular element. Thank you. Good. So try your best to look at an element which has eight protons, eight electrons, and then ten neutrons. So try it on your own. And then compare your answer on the, uh, to the periodic table and see whether you are correct. Now let's see some work examples. So I have atomic number of an element Y. And this element Y, it has atomic number 17. And its mass number is 37. So how do I know my proton number, my electron number, and then my neutron number? So let's look at how best we can do this. So I have said that the number of protons is equal to the number of neutrons. So just make this statement and then you equate it to 17. Because we have said that the proton, by definition of atomic number, you said the number of protons in the atom. So proton number is 17. So let's look at the neutron number. And say the atom is neutral, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. So electron number will also be 17. So you write your 17. Now, last but not the least is the neutron number. And then with the neutron number, we have said that the mass number is equal to the proton number plus the neutron number. So in order to get the neutron number, we subtract the proton number or the atomic number from the neutron, uh, so the mass number. So we have 37 minus 17, and that is giving us what? 20, right? So anything that is given to you concerning these examples, you should be able to work around. It's very simple. So another one, I have given the elements Mg2412, they do the following. So per what we know so far, what do you think my mass number will be? What do you think my atomic number will be? What do you think my number of protons will be and then that of neutrons and electrons? So here, per this that we have done already, we will know that my mass number A will be 20, my atomic number Z will be 12, and then don't forget that the proton number is the same as atomic number, so I have also proton number to be 12, and then the electron number, so the neutron number which we know, which when you subtract atomic number from the, uh, the mass number, we can get that one also. So my neutron number is what? 12, 24 minus 20 is also 12. Last but not the least, the electron number, because the atom here is neutral and not an ion, the electron number is going to be the same as the proton number, which is also 12, right? So this is how we go about things. So please, I am leaving you with this. One of the isotopes of uranium Use in nuclear fission, forget about the nuclear fission, is U23392. So it has a mass number 233 and then electron number, atomic number B92. How many protons are contained in this atom? Neutrons are contained in this atom and electrons are contained in this atom. Now you go down there and see that how many protons are contained in you, the same atom, but this time a charge of 3 plus in all. So please do this. It's very simple. Do it and you will be, you see that very easy. Right. I've taught you why we see 3 plus, the meaning of this. So you should be able to know that 3 plus, just say this, it means that it has lost something. So know what can be lost and what cannot be lost. Right. Good. So this also brings out what you call isotopes. What you call isotopes, right? Now we are saying that the atom of each element is made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons. For any atom, it has electrons, protons, and neutrons. What well, we saw in the subatomic particles. So in the subatomic particles, we saw electrons, protons, and neutrons. Now, for us 
to look at isotopes, first that we must consider ourselves is that for any atom or any element, all the atoms will have the same if atoms of a particular element, they will have the same number of protons and electrons. What changes is the neutron number. So I say all atoms of the same element have the same number of protons and electrons, but the number of neutrons can differ. And this will bring us to what we call isotopes. So atoms of the same element but have different neutrons, we call them what? Isotopes. So in fact, we have said isotopes are nothing but atoms of the same element, but they have different what? Neutrons different neutrons right so so we as isotopes are two or more species you can look at this definition this is more a bit or a bit technical whereas atoms isotopes are two or more species of atoms of a chemical element with the same atomic number and position in the periodic table and nearly identical in their chemical behavior but different atomic masses and physical properties. Right. Okay, so we are saying that as I said already, isotopes are not but atoms of the same what element or chemical element. So on the periodic table they will have the same position. They will have the same atomic number. But what they will have the same or identical, not the same identical chemical behavior. But what will change is their atomic masses and their physical what, properties. So take note of this. Right. Good. So we are saying that isotopes can be defined as atoms of the same element. So we have done that which have the same atomic number by different mass number. Of course, if the variations in the neutron number will bring us to variations in what? Mass number. So you can define it in terms of mass numbers as well. And we also say that isotopes are atoms of the same element with different mass numbers. So anything which is technically correct can be used to define isotopes. Right. Good. So this we have said this already, so please read it for yourself. Good. So as an example, if I seek I can write carbon 12, which is carbon with mass number 12. We have carbon 14. We have carbon 30, we have oxygen 16, oxygen 17, oxygen 18. So all these are atomic, uh, so isotopes of a part. So we have carbon 12, carbon 14, carbon 30. They are all isotopes of carbon. We have oxygen 16, oxygen 17, oxygen 18. These are isotopes of what? Oxygen. We have several others, but we use this as an example, right? We also have chlorine 35 and chlorine 37, isotopes of chlorine. Good. So we now look at atomic weight. Now since we have dealt with isotopes, for instance, if I take chlorine, chlorine as an example. So if I want a particular weight for chlorine as an element, do I use the atomic weight of chlorine 37 or chlorine 35. You see, it's very difficult. I cannot use any one to represent the two. So I have to find a way to get all of them on board. So we are saying that because most elements in nature have two or more isotopes, the atomic mass of the element cannot be taken as the mass of one of its isotopes. So I cannot use chlorine 35, its mass to represent all chlorine. And neither can I use that of 37. For oxygen, I cannot use oxygen 37, or so oxygen 16, 8 mass to represent all of them. So what do I do then? So we are saying that the atomic weight of an element is given in the periodic table. It's just the weighted average of the masses in AMU represent atomic mass unit of 8 isotopes found on X. The atomic weights. It's what the weighted average of the masses in atomic mass. So, if I want to look at chlorine, I'll consider the atomic mass unit of chlorine 37 and chlorine what? 35. And then I'll have weighted average of the two. And that will represent the atomic weight of chlorine elements. I hope that is clear. 
Good. So this quantity takes into account the percentage abundance of the various isotopes of the element that may be what? Present. So if I take chlorine element, how much by percentage of chlorine 37 is there and that of 35? So I will take into account how much it is present. Good. So when you look at this, we have what? A R which is the atomic weight. So I have A1, which is maybe isotope 1, multiplied by its percentage abundance. I have A plus A2 multiplied by its percentage word abundance. Then on and on to the last word, isotope present. So for example, if I take chlorine gas, which has 75% chlorine. 35 and 25 percent chlorine 37 so for my atomic weight i will have what 35 multiply it percentage abundance close your bracket plus 37 multiplying it percentage about 25 i divide all this by 100 percent and that will give me 35.5 so that is how come on the periodic table the atomic weight of chlorine is 35.5. So you see here, we are not using the mass of any of them. We are using the atomic weight, the weighted average of all of them. Good. So try this. The natural abundance of three stable isotopes of magnesium are 78.99%, magnesium 24. So its atomic mass unit is 23.98504. Please, if you look at the definition for atomic weight, we said we use the atomic masses which are in atomic mass units. So do not use 24 in your calculation, but rather use 23.98504. So we have 10% of magnesium 25, which has an atomic mass unit of 24.9858, and then 11.01% of magnesium 26. With an atomic mass unit of 25.9829 atomic mass units. So you are to calculate the atomic weight of magnesium and you compare your answer with the value they have given on the periodic table. Right. So that is a trial question for you. Good. So let's study this diagram and see how best we can. So this table and see how best we can solve the questions that are below. We have element or atoms labeled as K, O, R, S, T, and V. We have their mass numbers as 16, 37, 31, 18, and 23. We have the atomic numbers 8, 17, 8, 8, 11. Per our Knowledge on isotopes. Which of the atoms are isotopes of the same element? Now before we can answer such a question, we ask us what are isotopes? We are saying the isotopes are atoms of the same element, not atoms with the same atomic number. But we have different mass numbers. So let's go to the table. We have atom K with atomic number 8, atom S, atomic number eight and then atom t also with atomic number eight so it tells us that atoms k o r and then t are isotopes of the same element so our next question is how many electrons are there in atom of t how many electrons atom t has eight electrons why because it is not an ion it is a neutral atom, and in a neutral atom, the number of electrons is the same as the number of protons, and also the same as the atomic number. So the next way that which atom will really give, really form an ion with a single negative charge. Which will form an ion with a single negative charge. Even though we have not done formation of ions, here I will, tell, I will say that formation of ion has to do with the number of electrons in the outer shell. So depending on the number of electrons, if I take atom K, 
it has eight electrons and so in outer cell we have six and so for it to form an ion it to form an ion which will accept two electrons so it will not have a single negative charge so but if i look at r which has 17 electrons its electron configuration will be 287 so rather that for the next cell to be complete with eight electrons it will need just a single electron and when that single electron comes the number of electrons will now be 18 and so it will have so the uh, the c will be what the atom r and so the next one is the weight of the atom is that of alkali metal if you re can remember well, when we started our elements the, the when we jumped the periodic table the next was on the alkali metals and we said that those are metals or elements with which can react with water to form what? Alkalis or the strong bases. And we saw one of them as sodium, lithium, and the rest. And you know that sodium has 11. Of course, the, so it is 11, which is the atom V. When you write the electron configuration, to have 2, 8, 1, which is one element. And that is one of the alkalis. So look at this. So these are the solution to what we have just discussed. All right. I believe you are okay with this. Good. So thank you very much for your attention. Now I have here some exercises for you. You can do it on your own, but at appointed time I will let you do them and then we'll look at it and mark it. So here we have defined the thermoisotope. Name the instrument that is used in the term isotope. So neon, which has a total number 10, has three isotopes of mass 17, 19, 20, 20. So you have to look for the neutrons present. So you also define atomic number and mass number of an atom. So an atom has how many? 11 electrons. So you have to draw the electron configuration. State with which the type of chemical bond that will form with chlorine we also have this you have to complete this table so the table has boron b another boron b3 plus chlorine 17 so chlorine 37 chlorine 35 and then we have phosphorus which is p3 minus and neon so we have this with mass numbers some given some not neutral number of protons some give you some not and then the rest are not so you have to complete the table it's very simple so you are also to complete this table as well so you have various elements fluorine magnesium phosphorus potassium and some are given some are not so you are just to complete it right so this is very simple aside for you to do right